So my name's Caleb Alexander, and I'll be, um, I'm delighted to be able to uh, briefly announce the five speakers that we have in this next, uh, next uh, session. Uh, I'll briefly introduce them now. Uh, the first is David Brush, and David will be speaking about how ICU physicians manage end-of-life conflicts with surrogate decision makers. David's a pulmonary and critical care fellow at the University of Chicago. He attended medical school at Tulane School of Medicine and completed internal medicine residency at the University of Chicago. And his two-year fellowship program leads to a master's degree in public policy. The second speaker is Prudy Acharya, and she will be speaking about Fragile X Syndrome, Family Views on Disclosing Information. And Prudy's an assistant professor of pediatrics and a faculty member at the McLean Center here at the University of Chicago. Uh, the third speaker is John Yoon, speaking about levels of satisfaction and burnout among primary care physicians. Uh, is this an ethical problem? Uh, John's an assistant professor of medicine here and also on faculty at the McLean Center. Our fourth speaker is Margaret Moon from Johns Hopkins University uh, School of Medicine, and she'll be discussing an empirically-based curriculum development for resident ethics education. And she's an assistant professor of general peds and adolescent medicine. She's actively engaged in teaching uh, clinical research and ethics to fellows, residents, and students throughout Johns Hopkins. She's also a member of the Center for Child and Community Health Research at the Bayview Medical Center. And last but not least, um, Andrew Aronson, uh, currently on service, on busy clinical service, but uh, was able to make it here. And he'll be speaking about different conceptions of risk in the organ market debate. And uh, Andrew's an assistant professor of medicine specializing in hepatology here at the university. So as you can see just from the uh, titles and, and background of these speakers, I think that uh, they reflect uh, well the diversity of um, scholarly work that's done within the McLean Center and that takes place here. And I'm delighted to welcome uh, all of them. Uh, first, David Brush. Thanks so much. Uh, I thought I'd talk today about physician management of end-of-life decision-making conflicts with surrogates, and, and the objective today is to review um, some of the research I've done during my ethics fellowship with my mentor, uh, Dr. Alexander. What do we know about decision-making in the intensive care unit? Well, we know that 20% of all U.S. deaths uh, occur during or soon after intensive care unit admission. The majority of deaths involve some form of withholding or withdrawing of life support. And usually these decisions are made uh, by patient surrogates rather than the patients themselves who are often incapacitated. Conflicts between physicians and surrogates are not uncommon. And depending upon how conflict is measured, depending on how conflict is measured, it may be anywhere from 75 to 79% of end of life discussions down all the way to 30%. Little is known about how physicians approach these conflicts or, or disagreements over what the end-of-life decision should be. Um, and as, an eth as a pulmonary and critical care fellow, I had an opportunity for two years to sit on the sort of clinical side and observe different practitioners have these conversations with patients and their families. At the same time, I was interested in ethics, and so I was reading about sort of how to have a family meeting, how to um, engage in people about these discussions, and I started to get very curious about the discrepancy between what was supposed to be happening and what was happening in real life. So with the help of um, Caleb, uh, when I started my fellowship, we came up with three research aims. And, and one was um, to describe how critical care physicians are approaching conflict with surrogates. My observation as a fellow was that often these agreements went fine as long as the clinicians and the family members agreed. Um, but very different things were happening when the clinicians disagreed with the decision the surrogate was making. We were also interested to identify patient, surrogate, and physician variables that modify physicians' use of end-of-life decision influence in end-of-life decision making. And we wanted to survey critical care physicians' attitudes about the acceptability and effectiveness of some of the approaches we hope to identify with AIM-1. So to accomplish these aims, we sort of designed a mixed method study in two arms. One was to do qualitative work with key informant interviews of ICU physicians around Chicago. Um, the other is to do a mailed survey of 1,000 critical care physicians that we plan to mail out in January of 2011. Um, and I should also um, 
say that uh, we did actually put this into a grant form that was uh, funded by the Greenwall Foundation for a pilot grant. I don't know why it's doing that. Um, so I did semi-structured interviews with 14 ICU physicians around the Chicago area. Um, and we, tried, we did a purposeful sampling to try to capture physicians in different areas of practice. Uh, three universities, one university affiliated, two private practice groups, and one freestanding hospital. Uh, we all interviewed physicians in those areas. And the semi-structured interview was really an open um, questionnaire format where I asked physicians to describe their general approach to decision making, their approach to decision making when there's disagreement. I asked them about recent or memorable examples of managing disagreement. I also asked them to um, tell me about examples of either helpful and unhelpful negotiation techniques that they've used in the past. And also because we worried physicians might not talk about unhelpful techniques that they use, we asked, what are your peers doing? What are your peers doing that you find appropriate? Do your peers do things that you find objectionable? Uh, and finally, this was iteratively revised. And after the first few um, interviews, we added this question. And that was, and I always ended with it, uh, and to what extent, if at all, do the physicians persuade surrogates to change their decisions? Uh, th these were all audio taped and transcribed and then analyzed us using a qualitative analysis. Um, myself, a resident I worked with, and Dr. Alexander. So one of the most surprising things uh, was that physicians, when I talked to them about their general approach, said they usually had family meetings already with an objective in mind that um, a lot of times it came down to time, that physicians said, I, I understand that in, in the literature we're supposed to have these facilitative meetings where we find out what people's um, goals are, but there's a limited amount of time, and so we tend to only have meetings with strict objectives in mind. Um, one uh, junior university attending um, put it this way, well, I think it's human nature to have some, well, the majority of time I have some opinion about what I think the optimal outcome would be in terms of the patient. It's based on, one, the patient's condition, two, my experience of how similar patients may do, and then I guess the third factor is if I know much about the surrogate or the family in terms of what their wishes might be. And this propped up um, in many instances where physicians said they based their um, opinion about what the decision should be, not first on patient or surrogate factors, but on um, the prognosis of the patient and their understanding of how previous patients had done. Now, that, was just, that wasn't even in disagreement. That was just their general approach. Then we started asking what they do when surrogates disagree with them. Physicians said, uh, the first thing almost all physicians said was that they tried to find out why the disagreement was occurring. They inquired with the surrogates to find out why the surrogate was disagreeing in the hopes of finding a way to come to an agreement. Um, then they cited areas uh, sort of five domains where they saw the common causes. And oftentimes they're sort of querying both through direct asking, um, listening, and also sometimes nonverbal communication about why these surrogates might be disagreeing with them. Physicians cited lack of trust of the surrogate in the physician as an important area of disagreement. Um, surrogates misunderstanding, and I'll get into misunderstanding and what that meant to these physicians in a moment. Physicians sometimes perceive that surrogates needed more time to agree with them, and so used things like time-limited trials or extended the decision-making into a sort of a longer period of time and more discussions. Physicians perceive sometimes that surrogates disagreed because they were just having difficulty with the surrogate role, and physicians mentioned some various ways that they tried to help surrogates make decisions and change their decisions. And finally, um, differences in values were sort of cited by physicians as sometimes a reason why a surrogate would disagree. And it was the only domain in which um, physicians said, if that were the case, and really it was only certain values, it was religious values. Religious values were a reason for, for physicians to break off negotiations and let the decision stand. But if surrogates disagreed in these other domains, physicians said they usually tried to work with surrogates to correct these problems to gain agreement. I'm going to address just two of these issues for sort of lack of time. Lack of trust in the physician was cited by the majority of physicians, although we never asked about it. And I think the reason this is is because the physicians cited that they have no pre-existing pre relationship in the ICU with either the patient or the surrogate. 
And yet these are very important decisions to be made. And so they said oftentimes surrogates don't trust us because they've never met us. Um, if that was the case, if distrust was the case, physicians said they tried to build trust over time. Um, one uh, senior physician said, I think it comes down again to trust, trust availability, so being there for questions. And when families see engagement on my part, I think they're more willing to spend time listening and trying to understand what I have to say. There was a sense from the physicians that distrustful surrogates were not receptive um, to sort of the logical argument that physicians often tried to make about the goals of care. And so physicians tried to engage in these areas. Some physicians even, a few of them, stated that if they sensed that a surrogate was distrustful, they wouldn't actually have an end-of-life discussion at that time. And instead, they would put the discussion off until they built a more trusting relationship with the surrogate. Physicians also saw addressing misunderstanding as an important role for them. Nearly all physicians we talked to sought to correct surrogates' misunderstandings about patient illness, about prognosis, and also many of them mentioned what I quote, reasonable expectations. Uh, one physician in, uh, in a community practice said, I think ideally you should look at it as your job to re-educate them in terms of what a reasonable outcome is and what their reasonable decision should be. Some physicians took it even a step further and said it was their, um, they sort of viewed their role as also educating the surrogate about suffering. They said that many times the patients were sort of lying inert and it would, might not be clear to the surrogates how patients were suffering. And so they viewed it as their job to describe what the patient might be experiencing and how the patient was suffering. Now this wasn't done in all cases. One physician said, it's not, only, it's not that I only use that approach when he was discussing suffering with people that I think we should withdraw support on. It's that I never use that approach in people I think we should press ahead on. And so we came to the final question um, in, in our interviews. Uh, and the, although most physicians describe feeling surrogates out and trying to find ways that they, things that they could change to gain agreement, when we asked about whether this was persuasion, we had a sort of def, a, a clear split. One physician said this, once again, with few exceptions, the preponderance of these meetings are called to persuade the family to go along with the decision. And every word that's uttered by the physicians in these discussions is uttered with the intention of dragging them in the direction of the decision the physician would like them to make. Other physicians we talked to, even ones who had um, uh, discussed what some ethicists might be more manipulative and coercive tactics, said things like, I don't view it as persuasion, I don't like that word, I tend to think that I'm guiding them, I'm helping them with the decision. Many of them were much more comfortable with terms like guidance and very uncomfortable with terms like persuasion. One said, I don't like to think that I'm influencing them. Um, I think it's, you know, yes, I frame decisions, but uh, I think it's more subtle than that. So, you know, the critical care associations have all come out and said that what physicians ought to be doing is negotiation and shared decision making. Um, but I wonder, is this what they had in mind? Um, you know, it's not clear to me uh, how surrogates experience um, this sort of, uh, these sorts of efforts on the part of physicians. This also doesn't seem to quite fit anywhere in, in, the, in the current surrogate literature, and I have some thoughts about why that is. There may be two reasons. One, um, this is qualitative work and, and thus has qualitative limitations. There may be um, some generalizability that may not generalize well to what other physicians are doing. Um, but the other reason I think it might not have been captured in surrogate decision-making literature is that, one, much of the ICU literature is based on audio taped recordings of family meetings, but if you look carefully at who they're able to record, it's usually, in many cases, less than 50% of the meetings where people will even agree to sit down and have their conversations recorded. The other thing is that physicians always know they're being recorded in these meetings, and so maybe their, their behavior is better when they're being recorded than when they're not. So for future directions, um, and to see if this is generalizable, we're planning a large national survey of critical care physicians, and in it we use experimental vignettes. Um, we vary the patient's severity of illness and prognosis, but we also vary surrogate factors. In other words, is the surrogate close or distant to the patient? Is it a husband? Is it a brother? Do they have a good or very poor relationship with the ICU staff? 
Do they have a good or poor understanding of the patient's condition? And finally, what is the reason for their decision? In other words, do, do religious reasons cause a physician to influence less? And at the end of these vignettes, we ask physicians, if the surrogate disagreed with your opinion about what was best for the patient, would you and to what degree would you try to persuade the surrogate? So in conclusion, physicians we spoke with easily recalled disagreements with surrogates, described a very targeted approach to managing disagreement, often sought to align the surrogate's decision with the MDs, and while they shared common approaches, they called these approaches by very different names. And I think more research is needed to confirm these findings and also understand how they impact surrogates. Thank you very much. All right, so I'm gonna re review Fragile X-related disorders and their genetics, summarize a study I'm doing on family communication about Fragile X-related disorders, and identify future directions for this line of research. So mutations in the FMR1 gene lead to Fragile X-related disorders. These mutations are characterized by the length of the trinucleotide, trinucleotide repeats. So less than, 50, less than 50 repeats is what we consider normal. 50 to 200 is what we consider a pre-mutation. And over 200 is a full mutation. Full mutations lead to Fragile X syndrome, which is the most um, common inherited cause of um, intellectual disability. <clears throat> which is the newly accepted term for mental retardation, and a third of these individuals actually have autism. The premutation, um, people with the premutation are at risk for two different clinical um, conditions. One is fragile X tremor ataxia syndrome, or FAXTAS, and the other is fragile X premature ovarian insufficiency, or fragile X POI. Fragile X tremor ataxia syndrome <clears throat> is an adult onset neurodegenerative disorder similar to Parkinson's, and one in 300 individuals with a premutation will develop these symptoms. Fragile X POI <clears throat> causes early menopause and ovarian insufficiency in the fourth decade of life, and 20% of women with premutations develop these symptoms. I think it's important to say that these three con three conditions are clinically distinct, so um, if some individuals with premutations could have some learning difficulties or learning disabilities, but they're not going to have cognitive impairment to the level of intellectual disability. And likewise, people with Fragile X syndrome do not develop neurodegenerations, nor do they develop early menopause. So <clears throat> there's no symptom overlap between premutation-related symptoms and full mutation-related symptoms. The inheritance of Fragile X disorders is X-linked which classically means a grandfather can pass the mutation on to her, his daughter, who passes it on to his child, and because boys only have one X chromosome, they're more likely to present clinically with it. Um, an interesting aspect of Fragile X is that the mutation can change size. It actually can expand, so a pre-mutation can become a full mutation during maternal transmission. So in a family who had Fragile X, it could look like this. The grandfather could have a pre-mutation and have Faxtus, the neurodegeneration. He could transmit the pre-mutation to his daughter, she could have ovarian insufficiency, and she could pass this on to her son, and it could expand, and he could have full mutation in Fragile X syndrome. So, <clears throat> so each, family, each individual in this family could have a different presentation of a fra Fragile X-related condition, and Fragile X, as you can see here, is definitely a multi-generational condition. So this led to the question, so what do families um, how do families communicate about Fragile X? So what do they tell people within their own generation and what do they tell people in different generations about Fragile X? So here we have a schemata of a family. So currently, um, families are made aware, most commonly, that Fragile X runs in their family when a child is diagnosed. So the child usually has developmental delays and within, within the etiologic workup um, of those delays, the child is determined to have Fragile X syndrome. The parents are notified by the physicians. There's a carrier parent, the one who actually transmitted the mutation to the child, and a non-carrier parent, which I refer to as the partner. On the outer circle are all the family members who are vested in the child. The darker circles are the ones who actually are at genetic risk for either having a child with Fragile X-related <coughs> syndrome or themselves having a Fragile X-related syndrome. So that's, again, Fragile X syndrome, Fragile X um, ovarian insufficiency or Fragile X tremor ataxia syndrome. The light blue circles, partner and partner's family, are individuals who have a vested interest in the child, but they themselves are not at genetic risk for having Fragile X. So we don't know how, um, once the parents have this information, how they disseminate that information 
to the other family members, those at risk and those not at risk. Um, so what we know about family communication in Fragile X is that parents are counseled to tell other family members about Fragile X syndrome, so once they're made aware that it's in the family. Counseling recommendations about FAXTAS and Fragile X POI are less clear. How families actually communicate about Fragile X related disorders is unknown. How they communicate about the risk of having Fragile X in their family is unknown. And understanding these disclosure patterns could help us refine counseling guidelines. <clears throat> So I undertook a study to identify factors that promote and inhibit intrafamilial information sharing about Fragile X. Using qualitative methodology, I did one-on-one -on -one interviews with family members of individuals with Fragile X syndrome. They were recruited from Fragile X clinic, parents and parent support groups in Chicagoland and in St. Louis, and we did about 55 of these. So in our sample, 76% um, were women, and the majority were married, highly educated, and predominantly Caucasian. 60% were parents, and 29% were grandparents. 90% um, actually knew their own Fragile X status, and the majority of those were pre-mutation carriers. So what we found that there's several factors that actually promote disclosure, and these factors could be broken onto different levels. Um, the relationship level, the characteristics of the information recipient, and also characteristics characteristics of the subject matter itself. So related to um, relationship, emotional closeness was something that promoted disclosure. So if you had a sibling who lived close to you that you weren't on good terms with and a sibling that lived far away that you were on better terms with, physical proximity didn't really play a role in who you would tell even though they're both at equal genetic risk, you're more likely to tell the, um, the relative that lived far away if you're on better terms with them. Characteristics of the recipient that promoted disclosure would be female gender and re being of reproductive age. Interestingly, the people who commented on about <coughs> reproductive age being important um, as a reason to disclose actually also had a sense of urgency about it. So those are the people who also um, told their family members quickly without delay. And related to um, the subject, Fragile X syndrome um, compared to FAXTAS or Fragile X POI were more likely the subject of the disclosure. So the message that parents said was, you could have a child with Fragile X syndrome. Um, the message was um, less likely to be, you could develop Fragile X POI or you could develop FAXTAS or your child could have those disorders. So the premutation disorders were less of a priority in disclosure than the full mutation or Fragile X syndrome. Oops. There are also barriers to disclosure, and we found them <clears throat> again, on a similar level, so partner's family often was not told. Again, the partner's family was not told by the parent, the carrier parent, or the partner. <clears throat> and the partner's family is actually not at genetic risk, so they were not a priority um, to, be, to being told. And also the information recipient, if they had a different attitude towards disability than the parent themselves, they were not told. And these differences are related to age, so older versus younger generations, views of disability, and also culture, so different ethnicities. In the future, I'm going to do, um, continue this analysis, but also some subgroup analysis, looking at mutation status, looking at relationship, looking at ethnicity and gender, and also looking at facilitators and barriers of uptake of cascade testing. So once somebody finally has information <clears throat> that Fragile X runs in their family, what do they do with that information? How do they decide whether or not they're going to be tested? Thank you. I gave a version of this talk uh, to a group of primary care physicians several months ago. And um, before the talk, some students and residents came up to me with sort of a menacing look saying, you better not depress me with your talk. <laughs> so um, I didn't have a good response at the time. But after listening to Dan Somace's talk on the principle of double effect, I sort of wish I could have invoked the rule saying that it might be an unintended side effect. But, <laughs> Um, well, how do I turn this? In this presentation, I first introduced the problem of declining career satisfaction in primary care. And next, I'll briefly discuss some theories in the work motivation literature that address the topic of physician motivation and career resilience. Though much can be said about this topic, I'll pay particular attention to the role of burnout in the sense of calling. I'll then describe findings from a national survey where we explore burnout and calling among primary care physicians, or PCPs. And then based on these findings, I'll conclude with some final thoughts on the study's implication for medical education. 
Career satisfaction is on the decline in primary care. This graph summarizes some data from a Harvard longitudinal study of practicing PCPs from 1997 to 2001. And in 2010, we updated these findings utilizing the same survey item on career satisfaction. And we found that less than a third of practicing primary care physicians report being very satisfied with their overall career in medicine. We found that less, um, this is in contrast with physicians from various specialties whose career satisfaction tend to remain stable uh, in the 40 to 50 percent range over the same time period. This data confirms separate reports that describe a growing discontent in the field of primary care. Recent studies suggest that dissatisfied physicians are more likely to leave the profession and discourage others from entering their field. Moreover, as Dr. Reynolds mentioned yesterday, that there are fewer US medical graduates and residents choosing fields in primary care. This worrisome trend has led some to comment that primary care is on, quote, death row. Given that good primary care is deemed critical to, for high-performing healthcare systems, the plight of primary care in this country has generated heightened concern, both in the professional and popular media. That unfortunate patients like this one depicted here may soon be undertaking great lengths for a primary care physician and wondering, maybe there will be some primary care doctors available on this planet. The crisis facing primary care today is leading many to examine the various factors that motivate physicians to enter and remain in this field. What motivates physicians? Theories of motivation divide work-related motivating factors into those that are extrinsic and intrinsic to the job. Explanations offered for the growing disappearance of primary care physicians have tended to focus on uh, extrinsic motivating factors. For instance, there has been much discussion around um, salary and income differentials between primary care physicians and their specialty colleagues. Other extrinsic factors include educational debt, work hours, work conditions, and other lifestyle factors. Some motivational theories, however, suggest that extrinsic factors are more closely linked to career dissatisfaction rather than career satisfaction. For example, a high salary uh, does not necessarily make work itself in intrinsically satisfying, but a low salary can lead one to feel dissatisfied about work. Therefore, these theories posit that intrinsic motivating factors rather than extrinsic ones promote a sense of fulfillment and meaning in work and ultimately promote higher career resilience. Some of these intrinsic motivating factors include opportunities uh, for altruism, um, self-expression, intellectual growth, and opportunities to connect to others through work and community um, with patients or colleagues. But physicians do face challenges in their career, and one prominent obstacle is the experience of burnout. Burnout is a syndrome of emotional exhaustion, cynicism, and a perceived ineffectiveness at work. Burnout may prevent physicians from responding to the intrinsic motivations they have and thus pose a challenge to long-term career resilience. Nevertheless, there may be other intrinsic motivators that sustain physicians' careers even in the face of obstacles like burnout. One of these may be a sense of calling. In the work motivation literature, calling has been defined as a sense of purpose or direction that leads an individual towards some kind of personally fulfilling and or socially significant engagement within the work world. Research and calling has found that those who view work as a calling are more engaged with their work, spend more time working, and view their job as more central to their lives. For physicians, it may be that having a sense of calling to pursue meaningful work provides a strong enough motivator to persevere even in the face of challenges that lead to burnout. In our preliminary exploration, we started by conducting a national study of primary care physicians specifically to explore the issue of burnout and a sense of calling. So in 2009 and 2010, we surveyed a nationally representative sample of 1504 PCPs from the AMA master file. And among eligible respondents, we obtained an adjusted response rate of 63%. In the survey, we included variables of career resilience in which we asked physicians um, whether they regret choosing medicine as a career, want to go into a different clinical specialty, uh, intend to see fewer patients in the next three years, or intend to leave the practice of medicine in the next three years. We assessed burned out through, burned out through a single item measure utilized in previous national studies of pr uh, primary care physicians. For example, burned out physicians marked statements such as, I have one or more symptoms of burnout, such as physical or emotional exhaustion. To assess calling, we asked physicians to, to what extent they agree with the statement, for me, the practice of medicine is a calling. 
As noted on the right side of the slide, uh, we also included several other demographic and work-related variables in our multivariate logistic regression models. So what do primary care physicians overall think about their medical careers? 26% of US PCPs regret choosing medicine as a career. 38% want to go into a different clinical specialty. 43% intend to see fewer patients. And while 17% of US primary care physicians intend to leave the practice of medicine within three years. Um, next, we categorize all respondents based on their responses to the burnout and calling items. And we created four categories as described here. One, burned out physicians without a calling, burned out physicians with a calling, physicians who are not burned out and do not have a calling, and physicians who are not burned out but have a calling. So for example, our data shows 5% um, of burned out physicians who don't have a calling, um, while 65% of US primary care physicians report a sense of calling and no burnout. This slide shows the percentage of primary care physicians among these four categories who regret choosing medicine as a career. So first we see the burned out physicians on this side and the non-burned out physicians on the other. Uh, and we see that those uh, that burned out physicians to the left are more likely than those who are not burned out to report regretting medicine, regret choosing medicine as a career. However, we see that even among burned out PCPs, uh, physicians with a sense of calling here in red uh, are less likely than those without a calling in the gray to regret choosing medicine as a career. And this is with a multivariate odds ratio of 0.3 uh, after adjusting for other characteristics. And although time does not permit, to, permit me to represent the rest of the data, um, we also find similar trends with physicians who want to go into a different clinical specialty, who intend to see fewer patients and leave the practice of medicine in the next three years. Um, again, I have to mention that the cross-sectional design of our study does not permit definitive inferences about, the, about causation among the various factors. But um, our findings do suggest that burnout and calling may be important variables to include in a future longitudinal study of physicians that Dr. Farr, Kerlin, Ken Rosinski, and I are working to develop. We hope that this longitudinal study will help us better address the relationships between burnout, calling, and various other factors in physicians' professional development. In summary, our study shows that primary care physicians, physicians who report burnout are more likely to regret choosing medicine as a career, want a different clinical specialty, intend to see fewer patients, and intend to leave the practice of medicine within three years. However, having a sense of calling may promote career resilience in primary care, even among those who experience symptoms of burnout. Um, is burnout in primary care an ethical problem? One uh, of the consistent themes emerging from the medical literature is a growing loss of meaning and intrinsic uh, um, personal fulfillment in primary care, as well as the subsequent call to recover its intrinsic rewards. Burnout may be a symptom of this loss. For example, research on burnout is finding that burned out workers um, find their work unrewarding, experience a breakdown in community, uh, believe they are treated unfairly, and are confronted with conflicting values. So this has led some prominent researchers to describe burnout more accurately as, quote, an erosion of the soul. In medical education, the critical periods when medical students and trainees are at high risk for burnout, namely during their third year of medical school and uh, residency training, are also the same periods in which their sense of idealism begins to erode as well. So to, to counteract this loss, physicians with a sense of calling may be drawing from other resources, either internal or external to the profession, that help restore meaning and intrinsic reward to their work, even in the face of obstacles during their professional development. Therefore, efforts to understand and cultivate these intrinsic motivations may help attract and retain a new generation of physicians, particularly in an important field like primary care. Again, I'll conclude by acknowledging my collaborators, mentors, and the organizations that support this work. Thank you for your attention. Thanks, I'm Maggie Moon, and I am going to talk a little bit today about some work we're doing at Hopkins, trying to expand the empirical basis for ethics education. So at the Berman Institute of Bioethics at Hopkins, we have a program on ethics and clinical practice. And a few years ago, we sort of 
outline our own tasks, and those are to develop and implement curricula for ethics education for the residents throughout Hopkins, uh, which is, uh, I think they have 27 residency programs and probably 900 residents at this point. Our focus was intended to be on everyday ethics, and we really wanted to include some emphasis on the outpatient setting, mostly because we felt like that work hadn't been done effectively. In addition to that, we really wanted to expand the empirical basis for ethics education um, because it really feels like um, to teach well, you really have to understand why it is that you're teaching. And I felt like as we looked at what people were doing in ethics education you know, nationwide, it wasn't really clear that there was a really strong basis for the curricula. So we really wanted to look again and see if de in developing these new programs at Hopkins, we could do it a little differently and think a little bit more clearly about the what and the why we were trying to teach. And finally, the hard part of this is to evaluate ethics education. And happily, I don't have to talk about that today, but I would be happy to come and talk about it some other time when we have some answers. <laughs> so because we had a chance to sort of start this de novo, we decided to take a pretty formal curriculum development approach to, to um, ethics education for the residents at Hopkins. And so these are the six steps of curriculum development for medical education that, we, that we're really focusing on. So today I'm going to talk very briefly about um, the first two steps and, and show you the sort of the, the scope of our projects in trying to develop some empirical basis for ethics education. So the first question is, what is the a general needs assessment? What is the problem? And it looks like we understand that, that ethics and professionalism education is required in all residency programs in the US. But the curriculum is not specified. So all the people that talk about uh, ethics education never really tell you what it is that you're supposed to be teaching. And it turns out that whatever people are teaching right now may not be that effective. So there's all sorts of older data about moral judgment declining during training. There's a lot of data about the, how the hidden curriculum belittles ethics. And any of you have listened to sort of ward rounds or listen to people talk about ethics issues, you can hear how the hidden curriculum sort of um, puts it down a little bit. One of our very famous folks at Hopkins has been heard to say way too many times, ethics is stupid. And when the residents hear that stuff, they have a really hard time trying to figure out what they're supposed to do with it. Turns out that residents also report some dissatisfaction with their ethics education, saying that the training was inadequate, it doesn't help them identify and resolve moral distress issues. So I think the problem is a large one. If we're going to keep teaching ethics for residents, um, we need to make sure that we're trying to address this in a way that's at least, as, at least effective. We also understood that there was a relative dearth of literature on, on um, both ethics in the outpatient setting and also ethics, current, current literature on ethics in the inpatient setting. There's older literature on ethics in the inpatient setting, particularly in internal medicine, um, but really not very much about um, empirical work on the outpatient setting or the inpatient setting right now. Several authors have written about the need for a more epidemiological approach to ethics education. So that's what we're trying to get done. Okay, so our current projects. And so what I want to do is explain our current projects, not to give you the details of the data. I'll show you some of the results, but really to give you a sense of how broad these projects are and to see if other people have ideas about other um, approaches to the same sorts of questions. So we have a general project, a validation project, that I'm sure some people in this room got emails from us about looking at the domains for ethics education, things that we ought to be teaching residents, and, and uh, validating some questions for an ethics knowledge survey. And then probably more important to this whole issue is the notion of developing a better epidemiology of ethics in primary care practice and also inpatient practice. So I'll talk about each of these studies briefly. The, the validation project where we were trying to validate the domains for ethics education started with our own question, here's the things that we normally teach when we're approaching ethics education for the residents, but we weren't really sure if anybody else in the country would agree that these were the right things. We were sort of making these up off the top of our heads, things that we understood to be most important, but they really weren't even validated on a national perspective. So we sent questions to a group of medical ethicists in the US and asked a couple different things. One, we listed the 11 domains of ethics teaching that we felt were most common, the things that we were most commonly teaching, and asked them to identify the relevance. Of the 11 domains we uh, sent out, nine of them were scored as at least really important or critically important. So those uh, are listed there. Um, and I think most of those things you guys are all familiar with are things that we, are, you know, we all teach all the time probably. So there was a lot of agreement, it turned out there's a lot of agreement between ethicists in the US about what, uh, what the relevant domains for ethics education. But the, and then based on that, we also developed a, a a pre and post test. So we validated questions based on, based on each of the domains that this group of ethicists agreed that was important. We wrote pre and post test questions and sent those questions back out to get validated. So we've developed this sort of pre and post test knowledge survey with questions that have all scored high on the validity and the quality realm. 
we're just piloting that right now. It'll be interesting to see if it ends up being a useful pre and post test. I think sort of survey tests or questionnaires about ethics and knowledge are, are fraught with difficulty. Okay, so the more interesting studies. This is one of the studies we did a couple years ago. It was an observation project in the outpatient pediatric clinic. So this was really, uh, you know, sort of the most basic qualitative analysis project. We sat still and listened very carefully for many, many hours to hear what residents said to their preceptors about the cases they were seeing in their outpatient clinic. And we listened and just wrote down everything that sounded anything like ethics. And then we took all the information, um, you know, 70 hours of direct observation, uh, transcribed all that data and coded it as through a qualitative analysis program. And what we were looking for is anything, we talked about ethics issues in this one as anything that was looked like a conflict about what ought to be done that appeared to arise from competing moral obligations. So that's sort of a very specific definition of, in, of ethics, very principle based. It was, um, gets back to what we're trying to teach. It sort of, it works well to, when you're talking about teaching to look at ethics this way. So it is accepted as sort of a limited approach to ethics. From that data, the themes that were generated, so these are things that the residents are talking about with their preceptors as they're seeing their patients in continuity clinic. Um, so the themes that came up, promoting the child's best interest in complex and resource poor home and social settings, part of that is specific to where we work. Baltimore is a very, uh, it's a very urban setting and a lot of our patients are very poor. So this sort of complexity may not pertain to all training programs, certainly is a big part of ours. Managing the therapeutic alliance is very important. Protecting patient privacy and confidentiality. Balancing the dual roles of the learner and the provider. And then learning to use professional authority appropriately. So the ones that I have an asterisk by are those that are not commonly discussed in the literature on pediatric ethics. So the managing the therapeutic alliance is uh, you know, a big deal in pediatrics. Protecting patient, pri patient privacy is a big deal in all sorts of ethics. Another. Uh, approach to developing a better epidemiology of ethics in pediatrics, at least, is a narrative project that we've been conducting with the PEDS residents for several years. So the residents in pediatrics write about ethics early in their first year, in, in their internship year, and then again in their uh, second year. And the idea is that they're going to talk about their personal experience with a case, and they're going to write about the case. And I don't give a whole lot of direction about what to write about. I just ask them to tell me what the case was, how they resolved it, what they learned from it, what they think about it, why they think what they think. So we looked at two things there. One was just a, a content analysis to look at the themes from the cases presented in the residents' writing to see if it matched the themes that we saw in the outpatient clinic and themes that were expressed in other places. And we also looked, we're trying to develop a way to monitor, to measure changes in moral reasoning from, in moral, from ethical reasoning and ethical sensitivity from time one to time two. So this is actually a really fascinating project, really difficult to get done well. But these are the eight domains that we use to see if we could look at the way the residents wrote about their own experiences as interns and then again late in their second year to see if we could see a change. So in the narratives, the themes that, we, that the residents wrote about, so these are the things that the residents commonly wrote about. A lot of this is inpatient, not outpatient. But it's uh, duty to respect autonomy, which ought not to be a surprise to anybody. The therapeutic alliance again. Concerns about futility, specifically in the ICU setting, the NICU and the PICU. Concerns about providing suboptimal care, which ended up being somewhat related to the notion that um, it's that conflict between being a learner and a provider. Residents worried a lot that the care that they were providing was suboptimal just because they weren't very good at this yet. And then also questions about fair allocation of resources. Measuring the changes in ethical sensitivity and reasoning, we identified, one, that there was absolutely no evidence that there was any decline in the residents' capacity for ethical reasoning between time one and time two. And specifically, we noticed that <clears throat> there were significant gains in their use of professional and personal values and the way they explained them, the way they um, related them to the patient's values. It also turned out that I think our rubric for analysis needs work. It's a very, it's sort of a, it's a difficult thing to feel like you're doing correctly. So we'll continue to work on that as time goes on. <coughs> Again, this is all about developing the sort of this expanded epidemiology for, es for ethics. We have a couple of inpatient, or, or one new inpatient um, project going on, and that is, um, Again, the same observation process, but this is the inpatient ward teams. We observed uh, a month worth of inpatient rounds. Um, so at least well over 90 case discussions were observed. <coughs> I have a cold. This is the problem with being a pediatrician in the fall. It's hard not to have a cold. And in addition, we did in-depth in uh, interviews with the residents and some of the faculty attendings. So that data is still uh, being processed, but the same, it's going to be the same sort of question to see, does what happened on the inpatient experience <coughs> match what happens in the outpatient setting? Is it match, does it match at all with what we teach? 
So we also had a similar project in the outpatient uh, clinic for the internal medicine group. So here at Hopkins, we actually have two separate internal medicine clinics with two separate sets of faculty. And they actually teach very differently. So it's interesting to look at these two clinics and do the same direct observation, listening to the way residents talked about ethics with their preceptors, talked about cases with their preceptors, pulling out the ethics issues. Um, so we did the same thing. We analyzed the, the field notes and the tapes um, through a qualitative analysis program, looking for ethics and professionalism content. Again, here defined even more broadly than with the pediatrics. The other thing we looked for here that we hadn't looked for before was whether the preceptors were identifying and teaching ethics issues implicitly or explicitly or not at all. So in that uh, study, 81% of the cases that we, uh, that we listened to had ethics and professionalism content. Interestingly, though, of those 81% of the cases, only 18, in only 18% of the cases did the attending actually explicitly identify the ethics issue. So they're happening. They're very clear that they're happening, but it's, rare, it's fairly rare that the attending will stop and say, this feels like a values issue or an ethics issue, or let's look at the implications of this from an ethics point of view. Um, and even fewer than those involved explicit teaching about ethics. <clears throat> On the other hand, though, when we talked to the preceptors about what they were thinking, they you know, revealed a very high degree of ethical sensitivity and insight. So for some reason, they're hearing it, they're seeing it, they're just not teaching it. From that observation, the themes that we identified were problems within the, the, between the physician and the patient, so the, the doctor-patient relationship related to communication, shared decision-making, and relationships. Again, the resident as learner came up with a, as a big problem, creating you know, issues of conflict and moral distress with the residents. And then physician system issues came up in the internal medicine clinic, not so much or differently than it was in the peds clinic, but um, physician system interactions, external influences, as like drug reps, the presence of drug reps, and physician frustration related to the system, which I think sort of goes along with what Dr. Yoon was saying. So that was a very brief run through. What I wanted to show was sort of what we're trying to get done here is develop a new epidemiology of ethics in clinical practice, specifically related to what residents ought to be learning um, and what we are capable of teaching. So it looks like we do need to continue this sort of work. I think we need to further expand the empirical basis for ethics education. What we notice also, Hopkins is an unusual place. I mean, it's a very specific sort of training program. It's a very specific sort of environment. So the things that we see at Hopkins may or may not hold true in other institutions, other settings. So we'd like to see this work done in other places. Um, we really do feel very strongly that domains for teaching should reflect the experience of the learners and should be connected to the goals of education. So I just put on here our goals, the goals that we have for clinical ethics education, which are drawn pretty directly from Dr. Pellegrino's article, a 1987 article he wrote, which I think was just brilliant in sort of describing what people ought to be learning. <clears throat> so I want to thank the folks I work with, and I want to thank you all very much. I want to start off by saying thank you so much for having me. Uh, and allowing me to uh, give this talk today. Uh, today I'm going to talk um, about how different conceptions of risk are used in the organ market debate. Uh, first I'm going to talk about the organ market debate and what I'm pertaining to is liver and kidney transplantation uh, for the remainder of this talk. Uh, as we all know there's a shortage of organs in this country. There's currently over 16,000 patients who are on the liver transplant waiting list and there's over 86,000 patients who are awaiting a kidney. Um, this is, uh, right now, this is, uh, there's initially started with deceased donor living transplant, but now there's living donor transplant for both liver and kidney transplantation. And initially, living, living donor transplantation was thought to be a means to shorten it, to, to make this gap a little bit smaller. And as we can see with these very, very long waiting lists, this hasn't happened. Currently, in our country, there's sort of two forms of living donor, liver trans, of living donor transplantation, both for livers and kidneys. I'll refer to direct donation as I have a family member or a friend that needs a kidney, and I'm just going to go ahead and uh, offer them my kidney. Same thing for a, a part of a liver. And then non-directed, which means that I'm just going to give up my kidney for whoever happens to be the next person on the list. Um, both of these do happen. Of course, direct donation happens a lot more frequently um, in this country. Because we have this shortage with both living and deceased donor uh, donation, a lot of people has, have proposed both monetary and non-monetary incentives in order to increase the supply of living donor uh, organs. But I'll say that the market for organs, when I say market, I'm literally talking about buying and selling organs, uh, is illegal in almost every country worldwide. 
That doesn't mean that this doesn't happen because it turns out that it happens quite a bit. So it's estimated that about 5 to 10 percent of all kidneys that are transplanted in the world worldwide occur on the black market. So these are kidneys that are bought and sold. Um, there's records of 2,000 kidney transplants alone in Pakistan that were, were bought and sold. This actually happens in our country too. Now we don't have a, uh, at least we don't know of a market that we have, but we do have plenty of patients that have been documented to go overseas uh, and, and buy a kidney. So we do see that. A very uh, interesting study that was done, uh, uh, published in JAMA in 2002, uh, took uh, pay people in India who had sold their kidneys and interviewed them and talked about some of their motivations and some of their health outcomes after their transplant. Uh, and these, it turns out that the patients that, and not surprisingly, the patients that sold uh, their kidneys tended to be very poor people. And the reason why they did it the vast, vast majority of time was just to pay off debts that they had. Um, and when they followed these patients after uh, the sale of their kidney and how they were doing after them, asked them a lot of follow-up questions, 79% said that they would never recommend to anybody else selling a kidney again. I'm not showing the data here, but their financial status was actually worse off a lot of times. Their health status, of course, was worse off. So uh, these, were, these were unhappy people that participated in this market. Taking studies back to our country, uh, this was a survey that was published last year uh, in a, uh, of the American Society of Transplant Surgeons, and this was looking more at reducing barriers to transplantation. So, and I'm talking about just living donors, obviously, and what kind of things we could do to maybe get people to donate their organs a little more and sort of reduce these barriers. And whether the transplant physician, now this was a survey of transplant physicians, physicians, whether they were for this and whether they thought that that would be okay. And as you can see, I don't have a pointer, but um, Things like guaranteed health insurance, guaranteed life insurance, and income tax credit, this was widely supported by uh, transplant physicians. They thought that this would probably be a good idea to help people uh, donate. But the line was drawn at cash payment, okay? So we saw these numbers drop off considerably when you took it from guaranteed health insurance to giving them, writing them a check for their, for their kidney. That was a different story, and a lot of people said, uh, most of the physicians, so only 10% 10, 10 strongly supported, and about 10% supported, and the rest were either neutral or, or against this. So we wanted to explore this issue a little bit further. Uh, what we wanted to do is understand the attitudes of physicians, uh, members of the transplant community, and talk to them a little bit about uh, kidney transplantation, but we also wanted to add living donor liver transplantation because uh, we're starting to see more and more of those as well, and talk to them about directed donation, talk to them about non-directed donation, and for those who are interested in, in legalizing markets, we asked them to, uh, to what their, their thoughts about those were as well. And we wanted to really, besides just knowing if they were for and against it, really the purpose of the study was to look at, get some insight into the reasoning behind uh, their stance on this issue and why they were either for it or against it. And we really wanted to get at this issue of reducing barriers to transplant versus where does that go, and where do you draw the line between that and undue inducement? A few details about our survey. This was an email and a mail survey that was sent to hepatologists, nephrologists, and liver and kidney transplant surgeons through various um, organizations here in the United States. Um, some of the questions we asked, we asked about organ markets for liver, uh, living liver and kidney donation. Uh, we asked why they supported or opposed these markets. Uh, and for those who supported the markets, we actually even went a step further and asked them about some proposed financial structures for the market that they thought would work well. We had a 50% response rate for our survey. Uh, a little more than half were transplant surgeons. The rest, rest were hepatologists and nephrologists. And 58% of our uh, respondents were in practice for more than 10 years. Uh, this is uh, a graph that's going to depict, a table that's going to depict some of the initial questions that we asked when we asked about their attitude. Uh, regarding donation, non-directed donation, and organ markets. And what you can see here is that uh, our first question was whether adults should be allowed to directly donate an organ. Um, the vast majority, 98% for kidneys and 95% uh, for livers, thought that that would be a good idea. So most people, and this happens all the time in our country, most people were okay with this. When we moved over to non-directed donation, again, donating an organ to an unknown recipient, an unrelated recipient, 94% uh, uh, were in favor of this for kidney, a little less for liver, 67%, but still the majority thought that this would be okay. Once again, we saw these numbers 
drastically drop off when we talked about a market. So the voluntary sale, and this was the exact question used in our questionnaire, the voluntary uh, sale of organs by healthy adults should be legalized in the United States. Only 20% agreed with this uh, for kidneys and 10% agreed with this for uh, living donor uh, liver transplantation. So we wanted to go a little bit further and talk about the, what I mentioned before, talk about sort of the reasoning behind this. Uh, and we talk about, uh, and so we took the patient, we took the respondents that either objected or supported and we asked them uh, more questions. So this is the, uh, some of the data from those who objected uh, to an organ market. And the most common reasons why they objected uh, were potential exploitation of the poor and risk to donors. And interestingly, some of the things that we th thought might be as important really didn't turn out to be that important. Uh, the sanctioning of sale uh, diminishes human dignity was far below risk to donors um, and some of these other things. So really the big picture here was it was exploitation and risk to donors were what we kept seeing uh, with the objectors to Oregon markets. Switching over to the supporters, when we asked them similar questions, interestingly, this concept of risk came up again, and this was somewhat of a surprise to us. So the reasons why they supported it was they're talking about risk as well. So they say the risks of long-term uh, problems after a partial hepatectomy or a nephrectomy are very low, and they talk about the short-term risks of morbidity and mortality from the surgery being low too. And what we sort of thought, our hypothesis, was this is going to be an issue of autonomy. We saw autonomy was farther down the list. So this wasn't really what was going on. Uh, autonomy to potential vendors scored lower. And the question that we, and the, the statement, individuals have the right to dispose of body parts as they wish, was very low. So this was not something that was uh, a big thing. So uh, to wrap things up, I'll make a, a few points in my discussion. Uh, we found that transplant physicians were in favor of directed and non-directed uh, living donation for kidneys and partial livers for transplantation. This wasn't very surprising. This is going on in our uh, country every day. Previous data has shown that physicians may be in favor of reducing barriers to transplant, but the line was drawn, and I think it was drawn fairly sharply, that the vast majority of our respondents were opposed to the legalization of an organ market as a means to increase available organs. Surprisingly to us, donor risk turned out to be a very important issue, and even more surprisingly, it was the issue on both sides of this. So both of the sides of this, both the supporters and the opposition, were both saying that risk was the reason why they either supported um, or were opposed to this issue. And, and what we were thinking and what we're hypothesizing is that these sides just have different conceptions of risk, and not only what the absolute risk is, but what's an acceptable risk, and what's okay to put a donor through. And you can see when they're talking about operative risks or uh, donor risk, maybe they're just thinking very, along very different lines. And for the majority of those opposed to risk, I think it brings up some extremely interesting points and points that deserve some further study. Uh, so those that are opposed to organ markets, um, does payment, uh, for, and now we're talking and framing it as risk, which changes everything, but does payment for risk, does this, is this what actually represents undue inducement? And then is this the reason why uh, they're opposed to it? And also we go back to this concept of the autonomy of the donor. So if you're going to say that someone can't sell their kidney, you are in a way restricting their autonomy. You're telling them that they can't do something with their own body. But does the moral agency of the physician, does this justify overriding the autonomy of the donor? And this is something that I think is still subject to debate and, and deserves further study. Um, so I wanted to also thank uh, Dr. Siegler for uh, inviting me to this conference and thank the McLean Center very much. And also to thank Lainey Ross for uh, all of her support and help for this project. And if you're uh, interested, this was published in April of this year. And here's the citation if you guys would ever like to read more details of our study. Thank you. And I would just um, request uh, questions brief, and um, uh, we'll try to have responses uh, similarly brief so that we can have some good uh, back and forth here. So I saw a few hands up. Uh, it was a person in the room. It was me sitting in the corner. Actually, I me and my colleagues, we would trade off, but sitting in the corner, um, listening and writing here. We couldn't record it for lots of privacy reasons, and we could go into a room with the patients for the same privacy reasons. So it was, it was old-fashioned. Um, yeah, that's a good point. Maybe I want to do this. Uh, look at the.
those specific physicians who are burned out and have a sense of calling and, and sort of um, down to more um, you know, other factors, what, what characterizes this group? Uh, I have some other variables about satisfaction um, and um, some other things that I can maybe take a look at. Thank you. Yes, right here. I didn't go into it, but in fact, one of the things in our survey that we do is we split the survey. And we actually, rather than ask whether they persuade or whether it's rhetoric, we talk about the behaviors that the physicians, really behaviors of rhetoric. And we ask one group, how frequently, if there's a disagreement, do you employ these? And then we ask the other group to judge the acceptability of that. And so we ask them sort of, is this ethically correct? And we'll actually be able to then um, look at their demographics, match the demographics, and get a sense of how physicians both practice some of these behaviors and also how they view the ethics of these behaviors as well. <clears throat> so, um, Kelly Ron at the back in the green did a did some work on CF and disclosure and the kind of emotional closeness was a theme that they found there too. Um, I think that overall there's not, um, because there's not a lot of literature about excellent disorders and also this kind of thing I repeat. Um, and so I can, um, CF is something that we can look at, but there's not a lot of exactly where it looks. Thank you very much. Please join me again in, in uh, congratulating our speakers.